Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Tim Weston, and I teach in the history department. I uh, emphasize I'm a, a professor of modern Chinese history, and it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome today Professor Terry Lautz, um, who will be uh, our speaker and talking about his uh, recent, uh, much celebrated book, John Birch, A Life. I was just talking uh, with Terry about, uh, I raised the question of my students, uh, how many of you have heard of the name John Birch? Um, and uh, I saw no hands go up, no, no uh, hint of recognition. So um, that doesn't actually surprise me in the least. Uh, hopefully today you will uh, leave uh, saying you, you have a feeling for uh, who John Birch is, and in particular, uh, what his connection uh, to China was. Let me just say a few words uh, about our guest speaker and then turn it over to him. Uh, and before I uh, do that, I'm going to hand out for my students the sign-up sheet. So if you're not one of my students, you just pass it on. Thank you. OK, so um, just a few words. Uh, Professor Terry Lautz is currently visiting professor at Syracuse University's uh, Maxwell School. Uh, and he is uh, the former vice president uh, of the Luce Foundation uh, and director of the East Asian program at the Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs. Uh, at the Luce Foundation, thank you so much, Carla. Um, at the Luce Foundation, Dr. Lautz managed grants for educational programs between the US and both North and South Korea um, and has been uh, very involved in uh, American East Asian relations uh, more broadly speaking. Um, he, uh, his in interests and, and expertise range uh, across U.S.-Asian relations, uh, but also Chinese history, which is, of course, the subject I love, and culture and politics, uh, American missionaries in East Asia, out of which this particular project uh, grows, international philanthropy, and higher education. Uh, he was also public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, has therefore a great deal of background uh, in uh, the philanthropic organizations uh, having to do with promoting relations between uh, China and the United States, but also uh, Asia, East Asia more broadly in the United States. Um, and this talk, as I've uh, said to at least my own students, uh, is based on this book, which has gotten quite a bit of uh, airtime uh, and I think is uh, going to be uh, very interesting. So, Terry, uh, welcome again. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Tim, and uh, thank, uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, let me ask the same question that Tim asked of his class. How many of you have ever heard of the John Birch Society, the name John Birch? Wow, so, so I don't know if you outnumber the students who are here today, but uh, it's always fun to people, to, it's always fun to, uh, to speak with audiences where there are people who actually have heard the name. When I was a teenager in Michigan, I heard the name. I had no clue, I had no idea whatsoever that John Birch had spent five years of his life in China, first as a Baptist missionary and then as a military intelligence officer. And guess what? John Birch had absolutely nothing to do with the naming of the John Birch Society. He was, sad to say, uh, and it's really a, quite a tragic story, which I'll, I'll tell you something about. Uh, he lost his life shortly after the end of World War II in China at the hands of the Chinese communists in August of 1945. And it was 13 years later in 1958 that the society, the organization uh, that bears his name and still exists today, was founded and became both very influential and very controversial. Uh, influential in that a number of perhaps as many as 100,000 respectable Americans, uh, many of them uh, living in suburban cities around the country, joined the John Birch Society, which represented uh, strict constitutionalism, strict interpretation of the Constitution, states' rights, um, and was founded by a, a gentleman by the name of Robert Welch. Robert Welch was a businessman. He and his brother had quite a bit of success 
uh, with the James O. Welch Candy Company. And marketing candy was uh, Robert Welch's uh, specialization. Uh, and so he decided to, uh, he had made enough money, uh, decided to go into politics. Uh, early in his career, he ran for the lieutenant governorship of Massachusetts, lived in Boston, uh, came in fourth. So he gave, gave up politics, unlike some other wealthy business people whose name you might recognize. Um, and he decided to found uh, a, uh, it was not a nonprofit organization, but it was an independent grassroots organization, which he said was purely educational in nature. So advocating for these issues that, uh, that he believed in. Um, and if you were driving around the United States highways in the 19, very late 50s, or early 60s, you may have seen Billboards like this one, impeach Chief Justice Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Why on earth would anybody want to have a billboard like that? Well, it was because Earl Warren in uh, 1955, 56, had, uh, had, had supported Brown versus education, uh, desegregation of schools, and Robert Welch said, I am not a racist, the Birch Society is not racist, but we believe that this kind of decision should not be made by the federal government. It really belongs to the states, the individual states. And, excuse me. Well, to went further than that, though, in terms of his position on anti-communism and the flip side of that coin, which was anti-big government, anti-federal government, believed that the United States should withdraw from the United Nations a little tricky since the UN was right there in New York, uh, that uh, federal income tax should be, uh, should be abolished, uh, that uh, foreign aid was misappropriated, that American citizens should, should support local police, that water supplies, and this was a little bit later in the trajectory of the Birch Society, but that uh, water supply, there was conspiracy to uh, poison water supplies with, um, uh, with fluoride. fluoride, thank you, yes, right. Uh, and so uh, he was quite fond of conspiracy theories. Uh, he, there were those who believed that the, the all-knowing, all-seeing eye of, of God uh, was a, a conspiratorial reference on the part of the, the founding fathers uh, that went all the way back to the 18th century Bavarian Illuminati, uh, and Robert Welch uh, you know, saw conspiracies everywhere he looked. But the Birch Society, I think, would not have gained the attention and the notoriety it did had it not been for the fact that it was learned that Welch had written uh, in a private letter, which was about 250 pages long, to some of his uh, closest friends, which were, which were sizable in number, that none other than Dwight D. Eisenhower, President of the United States, hero of World War II, was a dedicated, conscious <coughs> agent of the communist conspiracy. Welch said that Eisenhower had knowingly ex uh, was knowingly accepting and abiding by communist orders and consciously serving the, con the communist conspiracy all of his adult life. He was trying to explain how it was that Eisenhower re rose to uh, positions of power and fame so quickly. And he was also upset because Robert Taft, who had been running for the presidency, a Republican from Ohio, uh, had been defeated. And, 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 and Eisenhower, who had no uh, experience, no background as a politician, uh, uh, became, became the Republican nominee. So all of this led me to wonder uh, about the Birch Society, but also the story of John Birch himself and who he actually was and how on earth it was that his name had become associated with this right wing, what was then branded as a right wing uh, extremist, anti-communist, anti-big government organization. 
So who was John Birch and why was his name used in this way? Uh, what was he doing in China? What does his life tell us about U.S.-China relations? And for that matter, would John Birch have been a member of the John Birch Society? <laughs> so those are the questions that I, I, I wanted to try to answer in this, in this book. Birch was born in India. He's in the, in the back there. The, the, he was the first child of seven. A seven, a six boys and one girl. I was fortunate to be able to interview three of his surviving brothers who were very generous with the information and, and time uh, with, with me. Uh, he grew up, uh, left uh, India when he was about two years old, grew up in Vinyl, New Jersey and Macon, Georgia. His mother's home was New Jersey, father was from Georgia. Went to Mercer University, a Baptist University in, uh, in Macon and was really, he excelled as a student. He was nominated by Mercer to be their Rhodes Scholar candidate. Uh, he was extremely bright, but he had also been, I shouldn't say but, I should say he was extremely bright and he'd been raised as a fundamentalist, uh, evangelical fundamentalist. Uh, he was an, his parents had uh, become independent Baptists. And independent Baptists are unusual because they don't believe in hierarchy, they don't believe in clergy, they run their own churches. I don't know if any of you are familiar with independent Baptists. But Birch very early in his life decided he wanted to be a missionary uh, to foreign lands and he uh, decided later in, in college after meeting a guy named Frank Norris who was a, a, a preacher from Fort Worth, Texas, that the thing for him to do was to go to China. and. I was saying earlier to Tim's uh, class this morning, uh, more American missionaries went to China than any other country uh, in the world. So it was a popular destination. And here is Birch on the left, or actually on your right, I'm sorry, with Oscar Wells, his colleague, in the streets of Shanghai, dressed up in their, their white suits and their white pith helmets. They've just arrived. And you would never know from looking at this photo that China had already been at war with Japan for three years. This is July of 1940, and China is in a rather desperate situation. But Birch was uh, deeply committed to being a missionary. He was enthusiastic and energetic about learning the Chinese language and learning something about Chinese culture. Uh, he was full of idealism. He was looking for adventure, I think, as many young people would be, and he was very much unprepared for this kind of experience. Oops. And here's a, a, a photo of Birch with Oscar Wells, uh, showing this is to demonstrate to the folks back home uh, how well they're doing with the congregation in Shanghai. But Birch went on from Shanghai after some language study to Hangzhou, where he worked for almost a year in a boys school and did some relief work, did some preaching. Then he decided that he would move beyond Japanese lines, the area occupied by the Japanese, to the town of Shangrao. And he did this uh, on his own, well, he was the only Westerner. Uh, he was joined by a couple of Chinese preachers and he, this is really out in the boonies, out, out in the boondocks. And he's not getting enough to eat. Uh, communications are very poor. He's receiving no money from his church back in Fort Worth. Uh, it's a pretty desperate situation. He's contracted malaria. Uh, and after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, he writes to the American military mission in Chongqing and it says, I would like to volunteer for U.S. military service. Uh, I'm willing to do anything you want me to do. And the military writes back and says, we'd be happy to have you. In the meantime, and I should explain why we have the map, that the nationalist Chinese who have fought valiantly, courageously, the Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek, uh, have been steadily pushed backwards. They've had to retreat to the southwest of China, to Sichuan province and the Guizhou and Guangxi area. 
And so the, essentially the entire eastern seaboard of China is blockaded by the Japanese, Japanese occupation. So it's very difficult to provide supplies to the nationalist Chinese at this point. The only way you can do it is by flying over the Himalayas, what was called the hump, uh, from India to bring supplies into China. The, the, the Chinese communists at this point are uh, still recovering from the long march of 1934-35 where they were forced out of this area, Jiangxi, up into uh, the, the Yan'an area which becomes their base camp. So they're still kind of rebuilding and, and uh, establishing their power. So while Birch is waiting from or, for orders from the U.S. military, he is having lunch one day along uh, a small river. He's out in the countryside doing some preaching. And he gets uh, a Chinese gentleman comes up to him and says, you see that boat that's uh, tied up along the river there? There's some Americans in that boat. And Birch, who's seen you know, no Americans anywhere around this area, says, well, that's just not possible. So he goes and knocks on the door of the boat. And he, are there any Americans in there? <laughs> door opens, and there is none other than Jimmy Doolittle and his crew, who have just bailed out after bombing Tokyo uh, two days before. John Birch is the first white man that they encounter. And Doolittle, uh, who becomes uh, famous for this really remarkable exploit, wins the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, Doolittle says to Birch, you speak Chinese, you know the territory, that, uh, can you help us out? This really was a remarkable feat, uh, described a little bit in, in the book, but nobody in the history of aviation had launched anything as big as a B-25 bomber from an aircraft carrier. Aircraft air carriers in those days weren't as big as they are now. Uh, and it's in and of itself a remarkable story. So this was part of John Birch's claim to fame. But Robert Welch, who established the Birch Society, went further. He said John Birch was responsible for rescuing the Doolittle Raiders. Had it not been for John Birch, they wouldn't have survived. Well, this is part of the myth-making, part of the mythology uh, about John Birch that, that Welch starts to, to build up, starts to develop. Birch never would have made this claim. The, the people who rescued Doolittle and his crew were the Chinese, and they suffered for it terribly because the Japanese forces came in and took revenge. So Birch goes to uh, the Chongqing area where the US has an air base. Americans had no ground power to speak of, no troops on the ground, no boots on the ground. Uh, it was basically air power, but that was significant, played a significant role. And John Birch fully expected that he would be a, a minister, a chaplain. Uh, that was his background as a, as a Baptist preacher. And he would be wearing a, a cross on his collar. He also really wanted to be a pilot, uh, you know, to fly an airplane. Uh, but General Claire Chenault, the commander of the Flying Tigers, that then becomes the 14th Air Force, had other ideas for John Birch. Chenault was recruiting young men like Birch who knew the language, knew the territory, and could survive in the field on Chinese food. They could live and work with the Chinese, and they could be liaison officers between the American flyers and the Chinese nationalist troops on the ground. And Chenault and Birch had a close relationship. Here's Birch receiving the Legion of Merit Award from Chenault for his, uh, for his service. And Birch was somebody who was widely admired by other Americans. Arthur Hopkins, who's the guy with the, the pipe at the jaunty angle there with the uh, is, uh, and these are all members of the OSS, which is the forerunner of the CIA. Uh, he said that Birch had an amazing grasp of the Chinese language, understood the people, was un absolutely fearless, completely unselfish, never thinking of his personal discomfort or danger. 
uh, an enlisted man, Ernie Johnson, who's on the right there, was a B-25 tail gunner. And he said that John Birch, who he got to know, uh, uh, didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't sleep with women, but he didn't self-righteously criticize those who did, who did those things. Birch, when he was in college and one year in a Bible school in Fort Worth, Texas, never had time for dating, didn't have time for, or money for that, for that matter, for romance. But in China, he decided it was time to fall in love. So he had relationships with none other than three women. Audrey Mayer, who was a Scottish nurse with the British Red Cross. Dorothy Ewan, who was a Chinese-American working with the 14th Air Force in, in China. Uh, her father was Chinese and her mother was of uh, Swedish background, I believe. And Marjorie Tucker, who was with the Yale China, Yale in China Hospital in Changsha. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to find correspondence with all three of these women, and that helped to kind of illuminate Birch's interior life, his own, his real, his real thinking, because he was often out in the field and he wrote quite a number of letters and he just poured his heart out to these women. He was actually engaged to the Scottish nurse for uh, two or three months. Birch worked with radio intelligence teams. Here he is as a captain uh, in Anhui province towards a little bit later in the war and was responsible for not only coordinating with American flyers, um, but also helping to rescue downed pilots. In those days, you know, airplanes didn't fly very high, and they were, uh, there, there were a, a lot of crashes, a lot of, uh, a lot of pilots that went down, and I think there were something like 2,600 Americans uh, who lost pilots, most of them, who lost their lives. Uh, there's a memorial to pilots from uh, China, uh, United States, and Russia. The Russians were involved early on in the war uh, in, the, in the city of Nanjing. Um, and a lot of these pilots also died flying over the hump from India. Uh, so it was also important for, for t teams like this one to provide weather reports for the pilots, uh, gather intelligence on, on the enemy, uh, and to recruit Chinese agents. So it was a, a, a busy life and it was stressful. Uh, you never knew exactly what was going to happen. Birch was not involved in directly in combat, uh, but he was sometimes operating behind enemy lines. Uh, and towards the end of the war as the Japanese begin to retreat. He moves from Changsha uh, up to Anhui province, in this, right in this area, uh, to, to carry on uh, these activities. And here's a photo of Birch. It's taken just a couple of weeks before the end of his life up in Anhui on uh, a, a base that had the code name of R2S, Roger Two Sugar. Uh, and the war was over after the uh, atomic bombs were, were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki much more quickly than anybody expected. Uh, there was great relief. There was considerable uh, celebration. There was some anxiety about what would happen next. But Americans, like John Birch, expected that finally they could go home. Uh, Birch had been in China for five years straight. He had refused a leave, a 45-day leave to go home. He said, I want to see the war through. Uh, and it's, it's, instead of being allowed to uh, pick up and go home, he was sent on one final mission from this R2S base up to the city of Shuzhou, which was at a strategic rail junction. It also had an airport. And he was, with it. He was leading a team of 10 Chinese, three other Americans and two Koreans who spoke Japanese, and they were moving by foot, by boat, by rail. They encountered one detachment of Chinese communist troops uh, who said, well, there's fighting up ahead. 
basically, there was a land grab going on between the Chinese communists and the Japanese who had been told not to surrender to the communists, right? And the nationalists are still in the, in the Southwest, so they haven't moved up into this area uh, yet at this point. But Birch is very determined, he was very headstrong, a very independent kind of thinker, and so he pushes on, uh, even though the railway has been uh, torn up, and he's becoming increasingly frustrated and I think exhausted. He's physically and emotionally uh, spent by this time in the war. And they get to this little town of Huanco, which is about 30 miles to the west of of Shuzhou. My wife Ellen and I were able to visit there. And he encounters another detachment of Chinese Communist troops from the, the Balujun, the Eighth Route Army. And they have orders to detain and disarm any intruders. And Birch says, why are you doing this? Why are you trying to detain and disarm me? He's only carrying a 45 uh, uh, pistol on his, on his hip. Uh, he says, we, the Americans, have won the war. He has worked with the communists previously. They have cooperated with the Americans against the Japanese, against the Japanese enemy. So Birch is incensed, and he grows increasingly angry. Tempers flare. One thing leads to another. Birch is shot and killed. The others with him, the other Chinese, Koreans and the three Americans are taken prisoner. Uh, the communists really don't quite know what to do with them. And they're taken all the way back to Yan'an. It takes two months for them to make that journey. Birch is buried temporarily in that small town of Huangkou. And his body then is removed to Shuzhou. And a Lieutenant William Miller, who also had known Birch, arranges a funeral service for him. It's a funeral service that is attended by recently surrendered Japanese and Chinese puppet troops. Can you imagine? This is the former enemy, and here are the Japanese and the puppet troops who had been working for, you know, fighting for the Japanese, paid by the Japanese, uh, honoring this young American who had been shot and killed by the Chinese communists at the age of 27. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of bizarre. <laughs> well, that might have been the end of it all, but General Albert Wiedemeyer, commanding general of U.S. forces in China, was informed of the death of an American soldier in North China. He was deeply concerned. He didn't know what this meant. Did this signal some kind of shift or change in Chinese communist policy? Was it going to be you know, open, uh, you know, op open sh uh, what's the word, shooting? Season. Season. Open season, thank you. I, I, <laughs> I haven't been hunting it enough deer lately, <laughs> or elk, or whatever. Uh, open season for, for uh, you know, shooting Americans. So he wanted to find out what, what was going on. What did this death of this American soldier mean? There had been another OSS detachment that had been detained over the course of the summer, and he was very much concerned, very much frustrated about that. Well, as fate would have it, none other than Mao Zedong, chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, has just arrived as Wiedemar is receiving this news about John Birch in Chongqing. And Mao, this is his first time on an airplane. Patrick Hurley, US ambassador, the colorful, flamboyant, unpredictable Patrick Hurley, uh, has escorted Mao, he's flown up to Yan'an, and brought Mao back to Chongqing for peace talks, negotiations with Chiang Kai-shek. And these are serious. Uh, Mao and Zhou Enlai, who was with him, remain in Chongqing for 43 days. But Wiedemar takes advantage of Mao's presence to have a conversation with Mao at the home of Ambassador Hurley on the evening of August 30, just five days after the death of Birch. And he says to Mr. Mao, as he calls him, uh, there's been a very serious and a very grave incident in North China. We can't let this happen. Mao replies, he says, I know nothing about this. 
If this is true, it must have been an accident, and I apologize. We learn later that Mao was furious at the way that he had been lectured by General Wiedemeyer, the way he had been treated. Wiedemeyer says, I must have the ability, the authority to send American troops anywhere in China. And Zhou Enlai says, anywhere? You mean anywhere? And Wiedemeyer says, yes, anywhere. Right? So you can see uh, this clash uh, over uh, you know, the issue of, of, of sovereignty and, and territory. The parents of John Birch, Ethel and George Birch, and here they are attending a memorial service for their son uh, in Fort Worth, Texas with Frank Norris who sent Birch to China. Uh, the, the mother of John Birch, a very intelligent uh, and accomplished woman, received a telegram a few days later after this confrontation that, Mao, that Wiedemeyer had with Mao, uh, informing her that her son, and she was expecting to get the news that he was returning, returning home to Georgia after five years, she received a telegram saying that her son been, had been killed on the Longhai Railway as a result of stray bullets. As a result of stray bullets. Uh, so she took this at face value, but then she started to dig into the story and she learned that this was not the case uh, and became more and more skeptical, more and more concerned about what the story actually was, what had actually happened. There was nothing said in the telegram about uh, an encounter, a confrontation with Chinese communists. Well, again, the story might have just disappeared there. <clears throat> but Senator William Nolan, influential senator, Republican from California, Oakland, California, got up on the floor of the Senate after the outbreak of the Korean War, and he said, I am going to tell you the story of a young American hero killed in cold blood, murdered by the Chinese communists. With, you may have thought that they were cooperating, that they were allies with the United States uh, against Japan, but John Birch showed who they really were. John Birch sacrificed his life to demonstrate that the communists were not allies, not friends, but as is the case, as is proved in the Korean War, uh, that, that they were enemies. And communism, of course, has, the Cold War has now erupted. Communism has spread. And not only that, but China has been lost. You know, we're talking now, the Americans are talking about the loss of China, as though China somehow belonged to the United States. And so this idea of the loss of China becomes a very potent political, uh, uh, potent idea in domestic U.S. politics. And a number of Republicans uh, use this as a cudgel to, uh, against the Democrats, to, against Truman and Atchison to say, you were responsible for the loss of China. You didn't do enough to support Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese Communists. If you had only done more, uh, the outcome would have been different and the communists would not be in power. We heard the same thing after the loss of Vietnam, after the communist victory in Vietnam. Robert Welch got wind of the speech of Noland, Senator Noland, he actually read it in the congressional record a couple of years later. He decided that John Birch represented the values, uh, represented the interests that he was hoping to, to stand for. He went to the parents of John Birch in Macon, and he said, I'm going to give the recognition to your son that he deserves, the recognition that the US government has failed to bring your son. Uh, I'm, essentially, I'm going to make him a hero. The U.S. government had declined to give Birch any kind of medal for his service, any kind of award. Um, and so Welch convinced Ethel and George Birch that uh, he would be in a position to kind of right this wrong. And by this time, Ethel Birch is convinced that there indeed was a conspiracy to cover up information about the death of her son and that indeed there are communists within the US government, within the military, within the State Department, as 
uh, as charged by Joseph McCarthy, among others. Richard Nixon was also very much involved in all of this. So Robert Welch says, he writes a short biography, a hagiography of John Birch based on letters, information that uh, Ethel Birch has provided and says that John Birch's death was deliberate and unjustified, claimed as Nolan had that he had sacrificed his life knowing that the communists were uh, were bad news, uh, knowing that uh, the, the true intentions of the Chinese communists. And with the support of George and Ethel Birch here, shown with a portrait of John and then some of the brothers and the, the one sister, they agreed to the use of his name for the John Birch Society. The Birch Society was established in 1958 in December in Indianapolis. Uh, there were a number of businessmen who were uh, present at that time, including, including Fred Koch, uh, the father of, of uh, David and Charles Koch. Uh, and there are many people who have studied the origins of the conservative movement in the US who see some definite connections between the philosophy, the ideology of the John Birch Society, and then different iterations of the conservative movement including the Tea Party, now, now called the, the Freedom Caucus, um, and the, the uh, stance on the role of government, which of course goes back to the beginning of American history, uh, and the concern about the growing threat of collectivism and socialism, which really is the first step, you know, that, that's the slippery road to, the slippery road to, to communism. Robert Welch, I think, decided that John Birch should be the, the poster boy for the John Birch Society for, uh, well, four reasons. First of all, he said this man was a genuine American hero. Uh, he, was, he was religious. He was courageous. Secondly, he was described as the first casualty of World War III, the first casualty of the Cold War. Um, he also, as, as Noland and Welch argued, recognized the danger of communism. And then I think it was also important for Welch uh, to believe that the information about the death of John Birch had been covered up and there was a conspiracy to do so. And so for all those reasons, he uh, used the name of John Birch for this organization. I think most members of the Birch Society had little <coughs> understanding of who John Birch actually was, how he had actually died. The information, the, the uh, classified investigation of his death, which was quite thorough, uh, quite detailed on the part of the US Army forces in China, was not released until 1971, just after Nixon's trip to China. And uh, so, when the John Birch Society was you know, coming to the fore, uh, there was no real solid information about the death of John Birch and what had actually, had, had actually happened. But in appropriating the name of Birch, who Welch believed uh, this story, of course, would inspire and instruct Americans about communism and conspiracy, uh, in, instead of doing that and being really understood for who he actually was, he became synonymous with right-wing extremism and right-wing politics, and I think his identity for all intents and purposes was stolen. One of his brothers said to me, our brother uh, wasn't interested in politics. His life was all about religion. He wanted to stay in China as a missionary after the war. Of course, he was never able to realize that dream. So this is a book about religion, war, and politics. I think these are the three primary lenses that Americans have used to understand China, to perceive China during the mid-20th century. Religion was a, a, a way to save China, to rescue China, to share the values of Christianity uh, with the Chinese people. The 
War, of course, meant that many Americans understood China through the military. And there were many young Americans who went to China who were very unprepared for what they experienced in terms of Chinese culture. It was a, a, a complete shock to them. Uh, but this was the impulse to save China and to protect China. Uh, both of these, you know, saving and defending China are kind of are paternalistic in nature. But then when China is lost to the American way of thinking, the American dream, uh, the American hope for China to be liberal and Christian and democratic, uh, China becomes an enemy. And so, as I said, it becomes an issue in domestic U.S. politics. And China becomes, and I think remains, a very divisive issue. Uh, and Americans' uh, reaction to uh, communism continues to be uh, one that uh, we are grappling with uh, today, the idea of a, an authoritarian one-party uh, one politics. So these impulses to save China, to defend China, and if necessary to, to reject China, to say China is the enemy, I think these persist. So this book, I think, is a, a cautionary tale about the use and misuse of history. Uh, it's, it's a biography that I, I hope highlights some of the ways in which Americans have interpreted China and have uh, come, in, in the case of Robert Welch and the Birch Society, I would argue have really misunderstood China and misunderstood uh, what the life of John Birch was, Birch was actually all about. So thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, just a, one uh, thing I forgot to say, which is, uh, which is terrible, is to thank the Center for Asian Studies uh, and the uh, Center for uh, Western Civilization for making this uh, event possible. And the other thing I wanted to say is I've contacted the Boulder Bookstore, uh, and they know uh, that this talk is happening, and I said this is a book you may want to have more of than usual. So if you're interested, uh, I, I'm hoping that you can find that uh, down at the bookstore. So you're open for questions? Yeah, absolutely. So love, to, love to hear your I'll, questions. I'll just let you field them. There's no Thanks. To. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I read the book, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. And of course, I was an age. I know the John Birch Society. I was dragged to a meeting <laughs> as a teenager by a friend's father. Uh, and, and it was obvious they were Looney Tunes. <laughs> Uh, but my question for you is, if, if Robert Welch hadn't named the John Birch Society after John Birch, would any of us have ever heard of him? Oh, I doubt it. I doubt it. You know, the speech that, John, that, Robert, that uh, Nolan uh, gave, he sent her to Nolan, didn't get a lot of press, didn't get a lot of attention. You know, people were concerned with the, the, the immediate problem of the Korean War. Young Americans were, were dying by the hundreds and thousands, eventually. And uh, this was a very strange kind of way to say uh, history would have been different had we only known the story of John Birch. Uh, you know, it was pretty bizarre to make that leap. And so I think there were very few Americans who made that connection and responded to Nolan and Robert Welch was the exception to that. So you're absolutely right. But I don't think we would would have. No, I'm not sure exactly what it would would have been called. You know, Robert Welch would have had some other name, uh, maybe the Nathan Hale Society. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, it's fascinating to get this uh, background on the original John Birch. It's uh, a uh, case of identity theft. And, uh, but uh, and what I wondered about. I know the John Birch Society was pretty big here in Boulder County when we got here in mm -hmm. the late 60s and the 4th of July parade. There was even a, a John Birch float, which I thought was kind of shocking. But, and, but they seem to kind of fade it out. Do you have any uh, thoughts about why that occurred? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the Birch Society was attacked by um, uh, uh, people who described themselves as responsible conservatives, uh, including uh, William Buckley uh, in the National Review, 
around 1961, uh, Buckley was advising uh, Barry Goldwater, senator from Arizona, who was gearing up for a run for the presidency, uh, to uh, disavow Robert Welch and the John Birch Society. And Goldwater said, well, uh, I agree with you. Welch has gone too far in calling Eisenhower a communist, but many of my best friends are members of the John Birch Society. And I, I think one reason why it had some staying power is because there were many uh, average uh, American citizens who believed in the cause. And I think it was very effective because it did, it was, this is an organization that was very effective in mobilizing at the grassroots level. And there weren't so many organizations that were doing that through mass mailings. They organized uh, uh, local kind of libraries. They had uh, weekly lectures for members. Uh, you, could, you could be a, a year-long member or a life member. Uh, it cost less to be a member if you were a woman. Uh, it, <laughs> the, um, but the, you know, there was an effort to kind of put, a, put an end to Robert Welch, if not the John Birch Society. But it did, it did persist. I would argue that it really starts to fade in the later 1960s, with the exception of, you know, there's certain areas where the local leadership was still influential, still well organized. Southern California, in particular, was very strong birch territory. Uh, areas of Texas, after the assassination of, of uh, John Kennedy in 63, there were those who accused the John Birch Society of being responsible for this. They had nothing to do with it. Um, but I think what really, to answer your question, I think really, what really overshadows it is the radicalization of um, American society uh, during the Vietnam War period and the development of organizations that are m much more outspoken, if not violent, uh, the Weathermen and others. Uh, and the Birch Society never, or, never advocated um, violence. And so it does still exist. Uh, there is some continuity, I think, in terms of the ideology. But uh, it starts to fade from the middle to late 1960s. The other thing is the defeat of Goldwater, who Welch did support, and the right-wing conservatism that uh, the Goldwater represented was, was defeated. And I think after that defeat, uh, the Birch Society took a hit. Good question. Yeah, I think in many, many respects, uh, Robert Welch was following in the footsteps of Joseph, Joseph McCarthy, you know, who uh, is, uh, becomes uh, so uh, notorious during the early 1950s. But uh, Welch has uh, you know, he's drunk the same Kool-Aid. And he uh, you know, becomes convinced that, indeed, there is a communist conspiracy. And one of the ironies is that uh, Welch uh, is so little concerned with communism worldwide. I mean, he does write about it. He does argue that communism is just growing by leaps and bounds. He has a barometer uh, you know, that, it, that he uses in his magazine that's called The New American Now. Uh, and um, it was called American Opinion before. And this uh, barometer shows how rapidly communism is spreading. But his real focus, his real concern, was on domestic US politics and domestic US commun communism. That was the key threat. So there's a direct connection there with McCarthyism. And you know, the Cold War, the, the late Cold War period, there was significant paranoia, and I think good, you know, some good reasons for it. You know, would the Soviets acquire the the atomic bomb, you know, were there <coughs> spies in American society, Soviet spies in American society? Uh, there, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of anxiety, a lot of paranoia. And even in the late 50s, you have the, Cubans, uh, the Cuban revolution. Uh, Castro is on the move. Sputnik has just been launched the year before. So there's still a considerable concern and considerable uh, uh, you know, worry on the part of American citizens. So I think, you know, the John Birch Society, one of the questions I had to ask in writing the book is, 
why was it as successful as it was? You know, it had been dismissed as just being a fringe group. It had been satirized. Uh, there was a line in a, in, a, in a folk group called the Chad Mitchell Trio about the John Birch Society. <coughs> and there was a line that says, uh, you cannot trust your neighbor or even next of kin. If your mommy is a commie, then you gotta turn her in. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. And there was also a line about John Birch that said, uh, we only hailed a hero from whom we got our name. We're not sure what he did, but he's our hero just the same. <laughs> so that, that, there were some good lines for this line. Yes, sir? Could you elaborate a little more about the connection between Richard Nixon and the John Birch Society? Well, Nixon uh, did not support the Birch Society. Nixon, in the late 50s, early 60s, of course, was running for the presidency. He, uh, he was, uh, there were those who said he was affiliated, but uh, he disavowed the Birch Society. Ronald Reagan also was accused of being uh, sympathetic to the Birchers, which was not the case. But Nixon, early in his career as a congressman uh, from California, was very much involved in the Committee on Un-American Activities, you know, which called up so many witnesses and accused them of, of being communist. So he was very much part of that with Pat McCarran from Nevada and other senators and congressmen. And this was really part of Nixon's uh, claim to fame. And it was what you know, gave him a lot, of, a lot of publicity, a lot of attention. Uh, and so it's often argued, and I think there's considerable truth to this, that uh, a, an anti-communist uh, Republican like Nixon had the ability to go to China, to open up relations with China uh, in a way that others could not because Nixon had the credentials. You know, he had the, he had the, the, the paper trail. Right? And so that, that phrase, Nixon to China, means you know, going to the other side of the moon if you've got the right, you know, the, the right credentials behind you. He also, uh, uh, Nixon was uh, uh, one of the prosecutors during the Alger Hiss, uh, Whitaker Chambers um, trial. Exactly right. Yeah, and Alger Hiss was a senior State Department it's official. Spy, definitely. Yeah, right, it's right. it's been demonstrated that he was, and there were many American intellectuals, you know, who joined the Communist Party, were very sympathetic to the Communist, uh, the Russian Revolution, you know, in the 1930s, early 40s. Soviet Union was an ally of the United States, uh, you know, during World War II. So Alger Hiss uh, uh, was, was uh, huge headlines, big headlines, big news uh, in the late 1940s. Great book, Witness. Witness by Whitaker Chambers, yeah, yeah. Big story there as well. Yes. One thing that I noticed um, is the old China hands, service and all of them, who were really uh, quite objective in their approach and, and their assessment of John Kai Shek they seem to, when, when uh, you had the Birch Society and McCarthy movement, have taken away our, our uh, possibility of examining it more objectively. John Kaishek, rather than just saying, you know, we lost China and it was John, you know, that we needed to be supporting. What is your position of what happened to the old China hands in this juxtaposed to this? I think you're right. I think uh, it was a, a loss. I think uh, that John Service and John Patton Davies and several others who were uh, State Department, you know, Foreign Service officers in China during the war were doing their best to report on the Chinese communists. They were very deeply disillusioned, as were other Americans, with the Chinese nationalists, Kuomintang. Kuomintang had become isolated, had become uh, corrupt. Uh, there was inflation. Uh, it, it, it was... Uh, it, it was, you know, you couldn't be optimistic about the nationalists. So they, this small band up in Yan'an uh, that seemed so energetic and so full of optimism and idealism uh, looked very good at the time. And so some of these reports were quite positive uh, and there was some discussion about the possibility of an American landing in China to prepare for the invasion of Japan. 
And Mao Zedong said to these Americans, there was a small detachment uh, of Americans, maybe two dozen or, 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 or a few more. They were called the Dixie Mission. Uh, many of them were from the South, led by a, a Colonel uh, Barrett. And uh, Mao said to Barrett, uh, if you land on the coast of Shandong, you land on the coast of China, we, the communist, force, communist army, we will help you. We will be there for you. He wanted American support in return, of course. Uh, so the relationship actually was positive at that, at that point. But just to you know, get back to your question, I think there was a, a generation of people, not only in the Foreign Service, but also in American academia, uh, who were discouraged from going into Chinese studies or becoming Foreign Service officers. After all, not only was there this political cloud, but you couldn't get to China. You couldn't go there. there were, China was, there were no diplomatic relations from 1949 until they were really reestablished in 1979. And so there wasn't much of a career path. You, know, you could go to Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, that was about it. But you know, the US policy was to keep China out of the United Nations, which was successful until 1971, to uh, maintain an embargo. There was no trade with China and no diplomatic relations. So this meant that, you know, not only for, because of McCarthyism, but for these other reasons, uh, you had to think hard if you were gonna go into a field like Chinese studies. Uh, I, I did that not too long before Nixon's trip to China, and all my friends, even my parents, thought I was nuts. <laughs> Please. Well, <laughs> I didn't bring along my crystal ball, but uh, China, of course, is a, a steadfast in its position that there's only one China, and Taiwan is a renegade province. Taiwan no longer describes itself as the Republic of China. You know, for years, Taiwan, under Chiang Kai-shek, and then his son, Chiang Jiebo, claim to represent all of China. They no longer do that. They say, we are just Taiwan. So the, in terms of possibility of some sort of integration, some sort of um, you know, political solution, uni reunification, uh, that has become more and more difficult because Taiwan identity over, you know, since 1949 has become more distinctive Taiwan thinks of, people in Taiwan think of themselves as being Taiwanese first and Chinese second in many, many respects. On the other side of, the, of the, the coin, Taiwan and China have become major economic partners. And so the concern on the part of some Taiwanese is that these economic links will undermine their ability to remain independent. The United States still plays a significant role because of the Taiwan Relations Act. We are committed you know, by a, an act of Congress to pr provide defensive arms uh, to Taiwan. China, needless to say, Beijing opposes that, does not accept that. And yet, China has been willing to accept a status quo uh, to maintain the peace. Now that China has become stronger, has become more aggressive in the South China Sea, now that Taiwan has just elected a president, uh, a woman, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, who is with the Taiwan Independence Party, even though she is not preaching or advocating for Taiwan independence, nonetheless, I think there is some concern that China may say, well, we need to take care of this problem. They would pay a big price if they did so militarily. Uh, but I don't think it's totally out of the question. Uh, I, I, I think this is a, 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 a problem that has not been resolved and probably will not be resolved for a number of years. Yeah. 
But yeah. the politics of that were and what you learned from obviously a very careful review of that. The official report is uh, quite lengthy. If you go to the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, uh, you go into the OSS files, you'll find a, a you know, report like that on the death of John Birch. And it was, uh, I think, kept classified, first of all, because it was an OSS, Office of Strategic Services, operation, and uh, they're in the business of keeping secrets, keeping classified information, like the CIA, so they were not in any hurry to release this. I think, secondly, the circumstances of the death were embarrassing. Uh, the conclusion was that it was a murder and the Chinese Communists should be held accountable. But by the same token, Birch was held responsible for his own behavior, that he, it was determined that he had actually provoked the incident by losing his temper. And uh, by his, his actions. Uh, the Chinese Communists also gave a report to uh, the Americans and they said they had acted purely in self-defense when Birch pulled his revolver and it was about to shoot the Chinese Communists. I think that's, that, I, I can't accept that, I can't believe that. It would have been suicide to do that. Uh, but I think Birch did at least bear some responsibility. I think he was very likely suffering from PTSD. I think thirdly, relations between the Chinese Communists and the Americans at the time of this incident were very delicate, very sensitive. It was unclear what, where things were headed with the Chinese Communists and the Nationalists, whether there was, it looked like there was going to be civil war, but nobody knew the outcome. The Americans were trying their best to keep out of it, to remain as neutral as they could. That proved to be impossible, of course. But I think, again, that made the circumstances of the death all the more difficult to really explain and to really talk about. Yes? Uh, the domino effect, uh, do you think the Bird Society kind of used that to, do you think it strengthened people's belief in the domino effect? The domino theory, the kind of, the, the, it was the, one of the justifications for Vietnam. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, I found a, oh, a, a, a uh, Robert Welch never went to mainland China, but he visited Taiwan and Korea in 1954. And uh, actually, it wasn't from Welch, but it was from Noland. It was from William Noland that he actually used the term uh, dominoes. And he had spent considerable time in Asia. Uh, he, you know, being in California, he was oriented to the Pacific. He was very supportive of uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Taiwan. He became known as, as the senator from Formosa. <laughs> but Noland, Noland believed early on, you know, before the outbreak of, of the Vietnam War, uh, that yes, indeed, there was a, a domino uh, effect or a concern that, that the countries of Southeast Asia were open, you know, could, since China had fallen and there were communists in northern, northern Vietnam, uh, you know, it, it would just continue, as had, you know, the communists uh, take over in Eastern Europe after the end of World War II, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. What happened to the rest of uh, John Birch's party when they were taken to the mm. Yeah, the, I was uh, really flabbergasted to find a detailed report by the three Americans who were uh, detained uh, and, and taken to Yenna. Uh, this was in the, the Hoover Institution at Stanford in the papers of, uh, of uh, Wiedemeyer, Albert Wiedemeyer. And they described it in some, in some detail. And uh, one of them was very uh, positive about what the Chinese Communists were doing in terms of fighting the Japanese, uh, the way they were well organized, well disciplined. Uh, and one of the others uh, was almost the opposite. He was much more negative, much more critical. And so, you, you know, this was, I think, in a way, representative of uh, the American, you know, the, the polarization of American 
views about the Chinese communists. Uh, many of these, uh, these communist troops were young soldiers who uh, you know, were very poorly equipped, very poorly educated, not necessarily well trained, but they felt like they had a cause. And there's an you know, ongoing debate in Chinese studies about whether the communists rose to power on the basis of anti-Japanese nationalism or whether it was their policies for land reform and for uh, you know, social reform of the society. I think it's a very complicated mix of the two, actually. I don't know if you would agree, Tim. <laughs> what happens to the Japanese people who were held? Oh, I'm sorry. They were eventually taken to Yan'an. Uh, the uh, uh, Judah, the commander of the Chinese Communist Army, met with them personally in Yan'an and apologized to them for the death of John Birch. Equipment uh, that had been taken from them was returned, radio equipment in particular, which you know, the Communists wanted. This was returned to them. They were also traveling with uh, gold coins, you know, currencies. There were many different currencies and a lot of inflation. So these gold coins were returned to them. They were flown from Yan'an to, uh, back to Chongqing, debriefed there. I think they were told, don't talk about this. Keep this to yourselves. This is classified information. And then they flew from, from, from China back to the United States by way of India. Oh, uh, well, there were a couple of congressmen from, uh, congressmen from, uh, from California, Southern California, who were members of the Birch Society. There was, uh, in later years, after the death of Robert Welch, the chairman of the Birch Society was a congressman from Georgia who lost his life, actually, in the uh, KAL 007 flight. And I'm trying to remember his name. Anybody recall? Uh, anyway, the John Birch Society was very quick to say that the downing of the airliner proved a conspiracy. It was a conspiracy. They were targeting this congressman uh, because he was on this airline. Of course, the flight had been taken down, attacked by a Russian, a Russian <coughs> fighter uh, in, what was it, 80? Mid 1980s, um, yeah. So, uh, but the Birch Society didn't really concentrate on political candidates. Uh, Robert Welch didn't believe very much in the political system. You know, he he thought they were you know it was full of communists, and the best thing was to mobilize people at the grassroots level. Uh, so, uh, very different from. You know, some contemporary politicians who also believe in conspiracy theories, who also have a business, a business background, uh, but who are political candidates. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all your questions and your interest. <laughs> and